A wonderful good afternoon from Geneva. Very happy to be with you for this closing ceremony and closing session. Um, I want to share with you some thoughts about the global trading and logistics business and what the recent logistics supply chain crisis could mean for the future. But I have to manage expectations. I do not have the answers either. So I just share some data. I will share some analysis of what happened during the last supply chain crisis, discussing if these trends that I present number one will change. And finally, some, I think, positive developments on the technology side. Let me start with some long-term trends. Here at UNCTAD, we look at maritime and international transport and shipping logistics since 1968. So you really have some, I think, lessons learned and long-term data. Um, some quick looks at long-term trends. Globalization. The average distance traveled for the typical ton of cargo, container, bulk, liquid, per journey, has been going up. We have had more iron ore from Brazil going long distance, not only to Rio, but to Asia, or LNG from Trinidad to Japan, and so on and so forth, longer distances. We see a growing share of developing countries. Developing countries is a generic term, uh, historical. So the share of developing countries in seaborne trade has been going up especially when it comes to the volume of imports, which is the blue bar here, the lower, the unloaded, the imports. No? And of course, China is a very important player in this data. We also see a trend towards improved logistics. One way to measure this, in my view, is to see the share of inventory holding expenditure vis-a-vis transport expenditure. Now this data is for the United States, but it's a global trend that we spend less money on inventory holding, a smaller share on, on warehousing, capital cost insurance, depreciation, and a higher share on transport. Not because transport has become more expensive. It has not in the long term. Uh, we come back to the recent search but really because it has become more efficient. So the, we have more just-in-time deliveries, better trade facilitation, and less expenditure on inventory. We also see, long-term, more ports in the global shipping network. Year after year over the last decades, more container ports have been added to the global liner network. And we see a process of consolidation, which is linked to growing ship sizes. So as the ship sizes, which is the orange line here, have gone up faster than the volume, mathematically, there has been less space for companies. So the blue line is the average number of companies that, that provide services from and to the average country. So, these were some long-term trends. We may like them or not like them, underlying hard data. Then happened the crisis. Freight rates went through the roof. What happened? Why did they go through the roof? And the basic underlying model that I like to use to explain this, I'm an economist, I like these type of curves, we have a steep demand curve, meaning if I really, really need this input for my production or this iPhone for Christmas or this uh, fuel for my energy, I pay whatever it takes because transport is only one part of the final price. And the supply of transport services is also very steep once we reach a capacity limit. So what happened during the crisis? First, the demand curve actually moved to the right because especially the Western countries, uh, the US, uh, Europe, um, they went, the people, we went uh, less to the cinema, movie, restaurant, and hairdresser, but instead we bought things, which came 
largely from uh, China and East Asia. On the supply side, we had a reduction of effective capacity because ships spent 20% longer in ports and the containers were in the wrong place and ships were waiting. Um, and of course, you thought, well, Jan, please give us latest data. This is yesterday's data, <laughs> um, the latest freight rates. And you see how these have gone down again, the freight rates and also the cost of chartering or the earnings of a container ship owner. Basically, what happened is we are going back. The people are returning, leaving their homes. And, uh, and going back to the cinema restaurants and hairdressers and buy fewer things. There's also inflation, there's economic issues and the supply side crunch has been improving. Now, having seen this trend, this what happened now with the supply chain crisis, what does this mean for the long-term future trends? And if you look at one more year and those of you who know me might already have complained that the data I gave you earlier was not the very latest, but here you have it, the very latest available data. The distance traveled between 2020 and 21 has actually slightly gone down. Is this a first step towards a longer term change? I don't know, but people do talk about near shoring, French shoring, regional supply chains, maybe. Here is last year's data. Now, this one is from our forthcoming review of maritime transport. Please mark your agenda for the 29th of next week, 9th November, uh, where we will present the underlying data, the analysis. But for the first time in many, many years, the share of developing countries, including China, in global imports in tons has not continued to grow. Is this a long-term change or just a hiccup and we go back to our long-term trajectory? Time will tell. I have eight more years until my retirement. Maybe we can discuss this then at that time. Um, number of ports. It has been going down, the number of ports in the global liner network, even before COVID that started. So not quite sure what is behind this. Um, then very interesting, I think, um, expenditure on inventory holding has been going up, you know, and the, the, the share has gone up. Both has gone up. Expenditure on transport and expenditure on inventory holding both have gone up, uh, but the one on inventory holding has gone up even more. So the share has also increased. So a little less just in time, all these stocks, these problems with inventory holding, the high interest rates, it's a lot of reasons that explain this trend. And again, very latest data. This is already like fourth quarter data fleet deployed. Um, I have looked at this issue of bigger ships and consolidation for now since 1996. And every few years, there was another new generation of container ships. I've never seen such a long period where we do not have a further such a like no major increase in ship sizes. And is it a coincident? Also, the number of companies providing services per country, like an indicator for consolidation, has also not really continued. Interesting question. Uh, there has been some analysis, which I find logical to say, as long as ship sizes went up, all the big players kept investing in ever bigger ships to gain economies of scale, but the smaller and older ships were not taken off the market. They didn't go to scrap. They were returned to the market leading for years and years of oversupply. This may have ended. So the changes we see now coincide with the COVID-19 pandemic and we don't really know if this natural experiment in, in natural history, <laughs> um, what are now the causes of future changes? Will it be that we have reached this limit in container ship sizes? Or does it have to do with supply chain crisis? 
or are these linked? I don't really think there's a link between the maximum ship size, which already peaked. Um, yeah, it, it peaked, I think, not because of COVID. Bon, so this is like sharing some questions about long-term trends in international, especially maritime logistics, seaborne trade, shipping supply. One thing that has been positive during the last three years have been reforms in technology and communication and digitalization. I don't know your company, who leads the IT reforms, the CEO, the CTO, or is it COVID-19? Well, in many cases, in many customs administrations, many border agencies, there has been a motivation to move towards more digitalization. Early on in the pandemic, we are quite proud that we developed a 10-point action plan that went along the supply chain from the ship to the port, leaving the port, the authorities, transit, the legal framework. And a lot of these solutions that we have promoted have to do with digitalization. And we received a lot of additional demand for our services, our solutions, customs automation, port reform, smart port, single window, digital signatures. And I like to say we have to lock in the progress made during lockdown. One last slide in this context. You may have seen PowerPoints and charts of people showing you a balance as if there was a trade-off between either controlling or facilitating trade. And I think this is the wrong picture. I think we have seen advances and benefits to both to the traders and also to the agencies that need to better control because all the solutions we are promoting from risk management to automation to pre-arrival processing to more transparency, single windows and so on and so forth, they help both facilitate transport and trade and protect the population from COVID-19, but also uh, under declaration uh, smuggling and all types of trade we do not want. In conclusion, I have shared with you some long-term trends, big picture, discussed what happened during the crisis, asked a question without really having the answer, if the recent changes we saw are just a hiccup or a change in trajectory, trajectory. and finally, um, the, the good thing we have seen shipping in times of COVID with positive solutions. Thank you very much.